So <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second webinar. Uh, the slides are from the previous webinar. That's why it still says webinar one. But um, let me introduce myself. I'm Madhur Behel. I'm an assistant professor at University of Virginia. And today I'm joined by uh, Matthew O'Kelly from University of Pennsylvania uh, as well. And it's a pleasure to uh, have you participate or be interested in participating in the second autonomous uh, uh, F110 international racing competition. Uh, as you may already know, the, this year the competition is being held in Portugal. Actually, we are very excited about the fact that we get to race in a historical location in the middle of Porto. Uh, this is also the venue for uh, CPS Week, which is like a premier conference. Uh, in fact, it's a, a four major conferences in the cyber physical systems area, uh, and they have agreed to allow us and give us the space to host the international uh, racing competition uh, at this venue as well. The dates for the competition are going to be April 10th and 11th, uh, uh, which is the first two days uh, of CPS week this year. Uh, just a quick uh, shout out to all the people who are making this happen, uh, working hard to making this happen and make this competition a success. Uh, we have students and faculty from University of Modena and Italy, led by Dr. Marco Bertogna. Um, we have a lot of students who are up helping with updated build designs and also updating the software for the car itself uh, from Dr. Rahul Mangaram's group at University of Virginia. Uh, and then I already introduced myself from uh, UVA. Um, but we may be the ones who are organizing it, but I would like to emphasize that it's actually the teams which are the real uh, rock stars for this year's competition. We got a lot of response from um, interest in uh, from all over the world for teams who wanted to race this year at CPS Week. So compared to the first first race that we had in 2016, where we only had five teams, uh, this year we are expecting at least eight or ten teams uh, to race. And you see that these are all teams which are uh, not from the organizing universities as well. So this is just purely uh, a response based on teams who are able to build their cars following uh, the F110 instructions that are made available on our on our website as well. So thank you again for uh, expressing your interest and willingness to participate. Uh, I guess let me start off by saying if there's any one thing that is the takeaway from today's webinar, uh, it's the following, that from now until the competition, uh, the entire team of organizers want to work very closely with each team. Uh, we try to answer as many questions, both logistic-wise and regarding your car and the build itself. Um, we want to help you out to make sure that if there's any major problems you are facing with your car, uh, we can provide you with the correct resources to make sure that you come and compete in this competition because F110 is all about building a community. So this year, you may be racing in the competition, but in future years, at next uh, next year's conferences, you may be even hosting uh, the competition yourself. So just a brief uh, reprise on the timeline of what is what can be expected from now until the competition itself. So we had a webinar earlier this week, and a lot of the teams were able to dial in, but we understand that teams are dialing in from all over the world. So this webinar is a little bit early in the morning for us, but better for European and other Asian teams. Um, the most important thing that is to be kept in mind is you have to register for CPS Week competition on this link itself. So if you just go to CPS Week 2018 website, uh, there's, a, there's a links available for you to register and you can only register for uh, the competition. If you are attending uh, if you are attending a conference over there, you still may have to register to participate in the, in the competition itself. Uh, the registration deadline, the early registration deadline is going to be uh, on March 16, so about two weeks from now. And I really encourage you that if you have a car which is almost there, but you need or you are still working on it, I encourage you to uh, go ahead and register on CPS Week. This registration fee, by the way, is something which is getting charged by the CPS Week organizers uh, as part of their uh, expenses for us to organize the event itself. Uh, go ahead and you should register. On their website, you should also find resources for how to make travel arrangements and accommodation arrangements as well. Um, I believe that the organizers for CPS Week have uh, did a really have done a really nice job of making sure some of the accommodation 
uh, around this venue is available at discounted price. So if you register soon and then you can use their uh, price code as well. The same goes for uh, airline travel. Uh, they have partnership with the official Portuguese Portugal airline uh, and you can get a discounted flight rate uh, if you are flying to CPS Week as well. The other uh, major uh, thing due is the qualification video by all the teams and that's due after one week after the early registration deadline or it's due by uh, and i will explain later uh, in more detail what is required in the qualification video and finally uh, we will have uh, the race itself so the race is going to be in two parts the practice session uh, where you will get to try out your algorithms or tune your cars or map the environment or anything similar uh, a day before the actual race uh, and you will have a, a, a we will try to ensure that you have a lot of time on april 10 to actually try out your cars uh, and then the actual race itself will take place on april 11th and i'll briefly tell you a little bit more about the agenda so today we want to cover uh, the most pressing questions that we have been receiving so far so we will go into the logistics and the schedule of the race itself i will cover uh, in fair amount of detail, the layout of the track and the rules of the competition. Uh, and then Matt from Penn will uh, cover the updated version two of the build, which is much more easier and simplified build. Uh, also, he will, has, he will cover ideas about uh, mapping and improving the odometry on the car and using a better NVIDIA Jetson platform than the TK1, which was part of the first build. So before we dive into the details of the competition itself, let me take just a few minutes to give you a very brief background of what F1 by 10 is. Since I expect many of the participants this year will be racing in this competition for the first time. So F1 by 10 is, uh, as you can guess, it's the Formula One, but it's one tenth the scale and it's 10 times the fun for us to race these cars. And the whole idea is that you can build, drive, and race your own fully autonomous vehicle uh, while learning and researching on the same perception planning and control algorithms that are used on full-scale cars itself. So it's both a research testbed, but also a really fun competition to participate in. And at the end of the day, this is like a battle of, of algorithms that all teams will have the same hardware and they only get to beat other teams using a better algorithm on their car. The one-stop shop for, uh, for reference for this entire competition is f110.org. Um, and we always are, uh, are continuously updating this website, even though it may appear to be a little bit out of date. We are, the team is working on uh, updating this website as we speak as well. And on this page, you can look at both version one and version two of the of the build of the car uh, with very detailed instructions on how to put this car yourself. I think many of the teams already have uh, get started on building up a, a car for themselves, but uh, you will still uh, you can still visit for an updated bill of materials. Some things are out of stock, so we have suggestions on how to replace them. Uh, other than that, there's also detailed tutorials on actual software and the uh, algorithms part of the uh, the competition itself. So if you are not familiar with the robot operating system or ROS or any of these perception planning control algorithms, we have free videos. You don't have to register anywhere. You can watch them on videos and even go through the PDF tutorial and exercises. Uh, also encourage you to post your questions on the forum on this web page because we try to, uh, especially during this time leading up to the competition, we uh, always try to uh, answer the queries that team members have regarding the competition itself. So we, uh, the as I said before, the instructions to how to build, drive, and race these cars are available for free on f110.org and. Um, we know of at least a dozen universities around the world which have used these instructions to build their cars and they've been sending us uh, videos of their qualifications. So this is some of the videos that we received from our previous competition and I will talk later about uh, what kind of videos you need to send for qualifications this year. So every year for the past three years, our team has been uh, organizing either a race or a workshop or a tutorial at one of the leading conference venues uh, in this area. So we had our first race as part of the Embedded Systems Week in 2016. Last year, there was a big workshop at Census in 2017 that was held in the Netherlands. Uh, and finally, we have the race this year in Portugal. 
And this is the idea that every year the community will grow. And so everybody, now you are a participant and maybe in the future year you actually help in organizing a local uh, race yourself um, as part of the organizing team. And so we already have plans for another race later this year at the Embedded Systems Week, which is going to be held in Italy. And there's also a talk about uh, continuing the race at Cyber Physical Systems Week in 2019, which is going to be in Canada. So like I said, the whole idea of the philosophy of the competition was that all teams have similar cars with the exact same sensors. Uh, and then it's a battle of algorithms at the end of the day. So the only way you can outsmart other teams is not by buying more expensive motors or uh, better expensive LiDAR, but everybody has uniform sensors, maybe not the exact same sensor, but very similar looking capabilities. And so the only distinguishing factor is the, uh, the smartness of the autonomous driver that you are building. Uh, I also want to just show you uh, how the competition has evolved year after year. So in the very first year we started in uh, when this F110 was originated, we started in very narrow corridors uh, and started racing in very narrow corridors. In our first competition, we then started racing in slightly wider uh, corridor environment with better cars as well. But this year, uh, we're happy to report that we will be racing at a very historical location in the middle of Portugal. Right. So if you think about it, uh, the person or the people who designed this historical palace would have never imagined that there's going to be autonomous racing in this palace. So it's a very historical race in that sense. Um, this is the actual screen grab of the space where the competition will be held. I know many you had many questions about the about the actual arena where the race will be held. So just to give you a sense of how big this space is, this is 60 feet by 60 feet or 20 meters by 20 meters, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, and the track will not, however, be so large. Uh, it will roughly be about half the size uh, of the space that we have. Uh, and this is, again, just a uh, illustration. This doesn't mean that the track will look exactly like the, uh, like the picture shown in the slide over here. But just, just to give you an idea that it's going to be a mix of both left and right-handed turns. It's not all left turns or all right, right turns like in an oval shape or a corridor shape. It's a mix of both fast straight straights where the car can actually speed up, uh, but then it, for some parts of the track, you have to actually slow down as well. So you can't just run at constant speed or if you are running at a fast speed, you have to have the ability to brake or slow down based on uh, the configuration of the track as well. The exact layout of the track will be made available with all the participants uh, between now and the competition itself. A little bit more about what the track actually is made of, because I think this is important in terms of thinking ahead in how do you design algorithms or what kind of methods would work. Um, so here's some specifications for the track that we have in mind. It will be about um, 6 to 12 inches tall or 8 to 12 inches tall in terms of the height of the track from the floor. Uh, it will be wide enough for three to four cars. Uh, so in case we have head-to-head -head racing, which I'll also talk about in a bit. And then the track itself uh, will be either made out of cardboard walls or plastic ducts. And I'll show you those pictures next, but it could be a mix of both as well. So this is something we are still working on with the local CPS week organizers to figure out what the best track layout is. Since we have to actually have a, uh, a semi-permanent track that ha that can be removed uh, in case there's some other event being held in this space. So this is, this is the plastic ducts I was talking about uh, in the previous slide. This is one example of what the track can look like. Uh, this is roughly eight inches. So each of these pipes is about four inches in diameter. They are held upright by these acrylic supports. Uh, and this serves as a good barrier in case your car crashes as well. This can absorb that impact and make sure the components on the car uh, are not damaged uh, to a great extent. Uh, so one thing to think about is since the track is not very, very high, uh, you may want to mount the LiDAR lower to the ground and maybe even to the front of the car so that it doesn't get blocked by other components on the car and is able to get a good view uh, of the track both on the left and right hand side. So this is just a picture. You don't have to follow this configuration, but this is just a recommendation to mount the LiDAR in the front and lower to the ground. Uh, this is another example of what the track looks like. Uh, this, I would say, is a much smaller track, but it will give you an idea of that these pipes can curve and we can um, lay down both left and right hand turns using the same material. 
This is the other alternative that you can expect since we are still figuring it out. So this is a cardboard track, which is one feet tall. And once again, it's pretty straightforward. It's a good uh, surface for the LiDAR to detect uh, left and right walls in case you are trying to use that information to find the center of the track. Uh, in this case, you actually see the LiDAR is mounted a little bit higher, but that's because the track is a little bit taller as well. Uh, I think if you mount the LiDAR lower to the ground, you should not have any trouble regardless of whether we are using cardboard uh, or plastic ducts. Uh, and once again, the track will have both left and right hand turns. So let's talk about the qualification video. So uh, in the previous years, teams just sent us a video of their car either doing the keyboard control. This is one of the exercises on F110.org. Uh, or showing us some autonomous capability. Well, this year we actually have a, a criteria that I will email to all the teams. And by the way, this slide deck is also going to be made available. I will already send the slides to all the, all the team participants. I will uh, send them again to the new new participants who are dialed in. So the, the qualification video, uh, I think someone was trying to ask a question. I would just say, just hold on to your question till the end of this, this uh, part of the presentation and then we will take questions later. Um, so the qualification video is uh, has the fall has to have the following format. Um, just like in real Formula One racing, you know the drivers are the are the superstars of the racing team itself. So in this case you should take credit for and be the superstars for your own team. So when you send us this qualification video, it's not just about your car, it's about your team and, uh, and the participants of the team itself. So you should take time to introduce the members of your team, where you are from, what university or uh, other company or group you represent. And then you can also um, tell us about your team name and how did you even hear about Formula One by 10. So take a, take a good amount of 30 seconds to a minute to tell us about your team. You can then introduce your car. So specifically, you can talk about what sensors the car has, how much time did it take you to build your car and things like that. And then finally, you have to showcase autonomous capability. So you should showcase the car either running autonomously in a corridor or whatever testing environment you use to develop that car. Show us and us include that footage inside this video as well. In case you are actually doing mapping or anything more smart, so you, are, you can be able to do slam or anything similar, you can include that part in the video itself. Uh, and so as you can tell, this video is a means for us to look at the fact that your car is functioning safely and properly and in an autonomous fashion. But uh, if you make this video, you can actually use this for your own uh, purposes as well and maybe even get sponsorships for your team in the future. So this video is due by March 23rd. Um, so little more than or exactly three weeks from now. And we are hoping you can share this video with us, either send us the video itself or upload it to YouTube and just share the link with us. So here's a sneak peek into a somewhat of a detailed breakdown of the uh, two days when the, of the race at CPS week. Uh, as you can tell, we don't have the exact timings available right now, but just to give you an idea, on April 10th is what we call a practice session. So it's the you get to practice before the race, which is on April 11th. Uh, we will start with uh, looking at all the teams and the team registration. There will be some opening remarks by the organizers, but the bulk of the day is reserved for the practice itself. So you can, uh, in fact, the way this would normally work is that we would give you dedicated slots where you are the only team on the track. So you have full access to the track to map it or try out or tune your algorithms or PID controllers. Um, we will also have some kind of a car inspection to make sure it adheres to the rules. Uh, and then there's uh, the notion of uh, how will we time the cars that I will talk about uh, in the next few slides. Uh, that part also is going to be taken place on, on April 10th during the practice session. Uh, following the, on the following day is the actual race day and we are again still working on providing a timing schedule. Uh, but just like in uh, regular motorsport racing, we begin with a driver's briefing where we go over any concerns any teams have regarding any specific part of the track. Uh, if you are your sensors are failing or if some part of the track is too bright or the material is reflective or not reflective and things like that, uh, we may be able to accommodate those concerns during this driver briefing and the track inspection. Uh, then the actual race will last for a few hours and we have... Uh, different categories of racing this year that I will also explain in just a second. 
We do have prizes uh, for uh, each of the categories of racing. Uh, most of the prizes are going to be sponsored by NVIDIA in terms of hardware that we will give to the team. So uh, think of the prize as a hardware prize where you can actually improve your car for subsequent competitions as well. So let's go into the rules uh, a little bit and um, I'm trying to cover as many rules as uh, we have thought of so far, but this can also change leading up to the competition, but any such change will be announced to the teams. Uh, so the general rule is that you are only allowed to race uh, one ten scale cars. You cannot race bigger cars of one fourth scale or, or even bigger than that. And likewise, you shouldn't race very lightweight cars like one sixteenth or even less uh, shorter cars than that. So roughly speaking, one ten scale is twenty five by fifteen by fifteen inches, uh, except the antenna that you can use for the radio and the telemetry. Uh, we require that you use uh, a standard battery pack connectors, and I'll explain why the reason the reason for that is. Uh, and then we also require that we should have easy access to the radio receiver on the Traxxas car or whatever model of the Traxxas car you are using. Um, it is also expected that you have easy access to the ESC on the car in order for us to switch off the car if, in case it crashes or in case our remote um, e-stop switch fails. So um, I think like most of the builds will already have easy access to the ESC for you to replace the battery or switch the car on and off. So the one important rule is that the car has to be completely self-contained. What this means is that once the car is racing in autonomous mode, uh, it cannot be tethered. You cannot have USB cables or any other kind of a tether um, physical or remote uh, command being sent to the car. So it is fully self-contained, both in software and hardware. Uh, it's fully autonomous. Uh, you cannot send any control commands, steering commands, or even any tuning parameters to the car while it races. Uh, the use of NVIDIA, Jetson, TK1, TX1, and TX2, or anything equivalent is allowed. We do want to restrict the computation capability that is allowed in a car of this size. So please don't use any powerful uh, GPUs like a Titan XP or 1080 Ti or things like that, or don't try to mount a laptop on your car itself. So everything uh, similar to TK1, TX1, or TX2 is definitely allowed. The same goes for the LiDAR. It is, you can use any LiDAR, which is equivalent to the Hokuyo 10LX or 4LX, uh, but that's the limit which is allowed again. You, we don't use a Velodyne puck or some high capability or very expensive LiDAR that can see 100 meters ahead of it. Uh, the depth cameras rule uh, is very flexible. You can use uh, many uh, any type of depth camera, some Z camera and the uh, structure I, I, are Some examples of cameras that are supported easily on the chassis and Matt will show you the updated build for easily integrating these cameras onto the car itself. Likewise, you can use monocular cameras or stereo cameras as well, RGB, grayscale, all of that is up to you. We all actually encourage and also want to say that the use of odometry, any kind of odometry is also allowed. So if you are using wheel encoders or um, some accelerometers or IMUs, or if you're using the VESE, which is a custom ESC for the car itself, which gives you the RPM and odometry information, uh, anything you can do to improve the odometry and localization of the car uh, using these sensors is allowed. So having said that, I want to do, do want to emphasize that there is a lot of flexibility and the rules in terms of the build are not extremely strict. So if you are slightly varying uh, on what is shown here, we will allow it. Our, our main goal is for you to participate and race in the competition. And so we will not be very strict with all the rules, but this is the general guideline and you are expected to abide by them. So talking about uh, the timing system, so one of the reasons why we wanted easy access to the receiver is that we will plug in a transponder to every car during the race. This will be a unique transponder given to every team or every car itself. It plugs into one of the free ports of the receiver. And what this does is that every time the car uh, passes the same start finish point the timing of the lap automatically gets locked uh, this is an example of what that timing bridge looks like uh, from one of our previous races so you can see every time this car passes underneath this overhead timing bridge the lap time is automatically recorded displayed in real time there is no human element involved in measuring the lap time itself so it's very fair it's uh, it's also just an automatic system on its own um, 
And we will be expecting to use this exact same system for the CPSV grace as well. So that's why we want access to the receiver where we will issue a transponder to you on the day of the race or the practice, and you will just hook it up to your receiver. So the race itself uh, has different categories, but one of the ones which is going to happen for sure is the time trial race format. Uh, and the way the time trial works is that every team will get uh, a fixed amount of time to complete as many laps as possible. Um, and you, so you have multiple heats, so you get multiple shots at setting up your fastest time. And the idea of a single heat is that once this clock runs, uh, you can you can set set a lap time as many times as possible until your time your heat clock expires. There is a small setup time also allocated for every team to make sure their car is in good order or good shape, especially after a crash or two. Uh, so we take that into account. And then there's a few restarts also allowed if, in case your car crashes during uh, a lap itself. So we'll have multiple heats for the time trials. And at the end of all the heats, all the laps that you have set, we will only use your fastest lap time to determine the winner of the race. So a little bit more detail upon how this works. Um, so like I said, every team gets 15 minutes or that number can change. It can be 10 or 12 minutes as well. Uh, but the heat clock begins when your allocated slot time, when it is your turn to set the lap time itself. And this heat clock starts counting down. It, it does not stop during the entire heat. So if you if you have a collision or if you are restarting your lap, uh, all of that is happening while your clock is counting down from 15 minutes. Also, the timing system, this overhead bridge, uh, only engages once you have crossed underneath it the first time. Um, and so you are, you can, st when you, you can physically lift the car and bring it back to the start straight, and the next time it crosses under the bridge, it will count as a new lap rather than the previous lap. A little bit details about the restart procedure. So we do understand that these are race cars and uh, they may crash into the track itself or they may stop for some reason or something can go wrong during the lap itself. So the race track it will have uh, markings on them similar to what you see on the picture, these blue lines. Uh, these are checkpoints, right? So very similar to how you have checkpoints in video games. Uh, once you cross a checkpoint or your car crosses a checkpoint and crashes, uh, you don't have to go all the way to the beginning of the track to restart again. You can just bring the car to the previous checkpoint and continue from there. So the the clock will not stop during all of this time, but you are allowed to reset and reposition the car from the previous checkpoint that you clearly crossed over. And then there's a limit on the number of restarts that are made available per lap as well. So just a more details of the rules, you can read this uh, later as well as I send the slides uh, one, more, one more time, but um, the main rules are highlighted uh, over here in the slide. So once the car has crossed the timing bridge for the first time, it cannot be under manual control. This is the same rule as the one I said before that your car has to be completely self-contained. So you can launch your ROS nodes and all of, all of that stuff um, before the car crosses under the timing bridge for the first time. But once your car is in autonomous mode, you just have to let it run and you cannot send any manual control commands. Um, we will use something called the e-stop switch. Uh, this is a hardware switch that can connect to the battery of the Traxxas, which is why we wanted you to ha use the same battery connectors as the default Traxxas car. Uh, so we will use e-stop switches in case we feel the car is not running in a safe manner. So we can hardly, uh, we can remotely disable it through a hardware uh, stop rather than a software command. Um, you must complete at least one lap in any of your heats to be eligible for the winning prize, right? So if you're if you're unable to even complete one lap in the race, then you will not be eligible for any prize in any category. Um, so that's the other rule which is important and the rest of the rules just tell you what the team members can do during the race. So like I said before, there are predefined uh, um, checkpoints where you can restart and you can request a limited number of restarts from those checkpoints or predefined positions. And most of those checkpoints are going to be before slower tight corners where the car usually struggles. 
uh, and the clock does not stop when your car crashes the lap time will whatever time you want is spent on picking the car going to the checkpoint and restarting again is just added to the lap time so as i said before the time trial is going to be one <clears throat> one specific uh, uh, racing category we have other special racing categories as well where we expect teams to showcase their capability of the car uh, so these special races are of two two types it's uh, one which explicitly uses mapping so here you are allowed to map the track and and show that your car is able to run in a mapped environment uh, and then there's some tutorials uh, on slam on f110.org there's other tutorials on how to localize yourself in a map using monte carlo methods um, so by the way this is not to say that you cannot use mapping in the time trials you can use whatever algorithms you want in the time trial but and, and you may not have to switch them for the special case but this is a special category in the sense that it will have its own uh, winner and one prize dedicated to this category the one more category that we are considering to race and this is where we need feedback from the racing teams is uh, whether we should have head to head racing so time trials is a challenge where your cars are racing and setting the fastest lap but there's only one car on the track at any time in head to head racing we want to have multiple cars or at least two cars race each other at any given time so there's obviously a challenge here that we have to detect and avoid other dynamic obstacles or other cars on the track in order for you to race successfully and not crash so we actually are looking for feedback from the teams whether they think their cars are capable of participating in a head to head race it will definitely be more challenging and more fun but that's the whole idea of the competition so this is something that you should definitely let the organizers know if you feel that uh, your car has the capability uh, to participate and demonstrate a special race or a special head to head racing capability then we would be more than happy to have a dedicated uh, racing category around that so finally, um, there was a question on how do I travel with my F110 car to Portugal? And that's a really good question. So there are some uh, tips on how to do that based on our ex previous experience. Uh, I really encourage you to use a LiPo, LiPo safe pouch for uh, storing all the batteries in transit. Um, this way the airlines will not complain much when you tell them you are carrying LiPo um, batteries in your uh, check-in luggage. So first of all, yeah, you should check in your car. They will not allow you to take any of the components in the cabin of the of the aircraft. Uh, I also highly recommend you buy and use a sturdy case, something like the Pelican case or, or anything similar. The link to this exact case shown in the picture is included in the slides. Uh, but this case comes with a with a set of really good foam inside of it that the car fits very snugly and tightly and doesn't move much to the transit and we've used this several times before without any problems um, by the airport security or transit authorities um, one other tip is that you should remove the lidar from the car because it's the most expensive part of your build it's more than half the cost of the entire build so i would really encourage you to just remove the lidar from the car package it separately with lot of foam and bury it inside your clothes and your uh, and your other check-in luggage uh, but don't uh, keep the lidar inside the pelican it can get damaged during transit uh, because of the impact and finally another small point is that usually it's a good idea to take a picture of your car take a printout of that picture and paste it on top of your pelican case or whatever case you are using to transit transport the car uh, do provide like a contact information that the uh, airport security or other customs security or transit authorities can get in touch with you if they have questions about the content of the case itself so that was it for the first part of the webinar today you should always again use the forum to ask any questions um, i will hand it to matthew or kelly to explain the build and the updated algorithms for the new car, but before that happens, I want to just pause and take any questions about the logistics and the schedule, if there are any. So are there any questions? Um, I, I've got a question. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Nandan from the University of Connecticut. Um, and my question is in regards to the uh, parts. So um, when you went over the rules, you talked about how um, you were allowed to use uh, the VESC, uh, any odometry source, and any IMU. Yes. Um, in the bill of materials, only three IMUs are listed. Does that mean we're not limited to those, to those three? That is correct, yeah. You can use any IMU you want. Okay. Additionally, I, I think this may be answered in the next portion of the presentation, um, but we've been having uh, some issues with regard to accuracy um, from the SparkFun uh, 9 UF IMU. Um, have you guys observed that data from other IMUs is uh, cleaner or less noisy than the data from the initial one? Uh, I will let Matt answer that question. Okay. Yeah. The answer is yes. Uh, I, if I was building this, I wouldn't choose the Spark Fun one. Um, that's why we gave two or three other options in the new bill of materials. Uh, in particular, I think there's one called the UM7. Yes. Um, it's relatively cheap and it's much more reliable. It has a, a built-in extended Kalman filter on it, so it clean, cleans up the data quite a bit. Um, in the space of IMUs, you can spend thousands of dollars probably, uh, and to be fair, we're not really recommending those ones, but something slightly better than the Spark Fund would be appropriate. Um, we're, we're purposely not limiting uh, your choices too much here because as organizers and, and as people who plan to run this competition through multiple iterations, we'd like to know what works for teams. And uh, personally, in our group, we can't possibly explore all of the options. So uh, if there's creative ideas or solutions, we you're interested to see them. Okay, thank you. Matt, you want to switch to your presentation? Uh, yeah, can you pass me the, the token? Uh, I don't already have it. Uh, hold on. Yeah, and uh, just to note, if anybody has questions, uh, please do ask. I'll pause in a few places for them. Um, note that most teams right now are currently uh, muted or will be, so you'll have to unmute in order to ask. And if you believe that your question is not getting through, there is a, a box to type messages uh, in the chat. Uh, please let us know. Okay, let me make you the presenter. Okay, um, so thanks to Madhur for a great overview. Um, and uh, as Madhur mentioned, my name is Matthew O'Kelly. I'm a PhD student at University of Pennsylvania in Rahul Magram's group. I'd like to echo Madhur's comments that while we're here presenting, uh, there are a lot of students uh, who are working around the clock to make this possible, especially uh, in our group at UPenn. And I'm um, just here as a messenger for sort of the work that they've been doing. So. Um, my talk today is going to be uh, about the, the logistics and strategies for building uh, the new F110 v2 platform. Um, so the outline uh, is as follows. We're going to give an uh, overview of the new platform and some of the, the differences between v2 and v1, um, as well as some information high level about getting started. So which which components might change, do you need to order new parts if you've already built V1? Um, and I'll show some uh, demos of us shaking down the, the car uh, here at UPenn. And then I'll discuss sort of the key component that enabled this change, the power board, uh, which is a piece on the bill of materials, uh, which is open source and you can build yourself or you can contact us, the organizers, uh, to get one uh, for your own team. Uh, then I'll go through a walkthrough of the entire build, 
and uh, answer some frequently asked questions about uh, logistics for the competition. For example, can I use V1 if I already have it? Do I have to build V2? Uh, the short answer, and I'll say it now to uh, avoid any suspense, is that both platforms are acceptable. Um, finally, um, I'm going to preview two new labs and competition features that we'll be adding uh, to the website shortly. Um, so we'll have a tutorial for hooking up the MIT race car simulation to the, the messages and topics that are output by the default builds um, from the UPenn University of Virginia F110 car. Um, so that will be a new lab that will be available on the website shortly. Um, and lastly, I'll, I'll give some information about uh, additional features which we'll be adding to the course itself to make it easier to localize. Uh, and then we'll take questions. Um, but at sort of each phase of this, I can pause, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So getting started, um, what are the big differences between uh, V1 and V2? Why do we do this? Uh, so probably the biggest change is that the, the base plate, the chassis that uh, we use to house all the components is much simpler. It's only one part, and it's uh, located um, just an inch or so above the actual chassis from the Traxxas vehicle. So it, it lowers the center of gravity of the vehicle quite a bit. And uh, if you've driven the V1 chassis, you've seen some of the behavior uh, in turns at speed where the entire thing starts uh, pitching. Uh, and this is significantly better with a new chassis. Um, there's also a redesigned uh, camera and LiDAR mount um, that can accommodate a variety of uh, depth sensors, RGB cameras, um, as well as the, the Hokuyu LiDARs. Um, as I said, uh, the way that all this was, was possible is uh, uh, some students at UPenn uh, designed a new power board, uh, which can take uh, voltage from the LiPo battery and convert it into 5 and 12 volt DC um, to run the entire compute platform and sensors. So no longer do we have this uh, large energizer battery pack, which was sort of uh, one of the drivers for the, the height of the previous chassis. Uh, additionally, we have support for the Jetson TX1 and TX2, uh, which conveniently provide onboard Wi-Fi modules. Uh, so we're able to, to get around using the ubiquity part, albeit with uh, some limitations compared to that very large antenna. And uh, I'll be showing you clips from the build um, they're available on YouTube, but we've also been working pretty hard to update the website. So um, if you have a look at my screen here, this was updated just yesterday. Um, we have similar instructions for uh, V2 as V1, as well as the, the bill of materials here on the website. So expect uh, more updates to the website in the next two or three days. Hopefully we have everything necessary to get you guys racing. Um, and of course, if there's any questions, uh, Madura and some of the team seem to be doing a very quick job at responding on the forum. So please do ask us and we'll incorporate your feedback. Um, yeah, and I think there was some confusion possibly in the past with sign up, but it should be more clear now. All the links uh, go to the right place. And if you notice any that don't, uh, please let us know. Okay, so back to the point of this talk, uh, building the, the new V2 car. So uh, as you saw before, the lower profile chassis lets you put on a body. Um, this may be useful if you have sponsorship or uh, you know want to dress up your car, but certainly not necessary. Uh, here's it's in the, the chassis in all its glory without the plastic shell. Um, so Here's uh, sort of my first answer uh, to teams that might be wondering, should I build V2? So if you're migrating from the V1 platform, uh, you need to purchase a new compute module. So this would be the Jetson TX1 or TX2. Uh, I personally strongly recommend the TX2. It um, has more memory available on board and seems to be slightly uh, better supported than the TX1. Um, note that there are programs from NVIDIA for universities to uh, get these uh, devices for free. So they have a GPU grant program, and uh, maybe we can send out a link to that later. Um, 
you also need to purchase an Astro Carrier board. So the actual dev board that comes with the TX1 and TX2 is enormous. Uh, it's more than 12 inches by 12 inches. So, um, and you can see that this one uh, is about the size of a credit card. Uh, so it fits rather nicely and compactly on the chassis. Uh, and you'll also need to purchase a LiPo battery, uh, which is in the bottom. Uh, we think that this is easily available in the United States, um, and we've been working with our counterparts uh, in Italy who are helping to organize the competition to make sure that there's uh, either this battery or equivalent one available in Europe. And so, again, uh, with these new parts, if there's any difficulty in obtaining them, uh, please let us know, and we'll do our best to help you find an equivalent replacement. Okay, so those are the things you need to buy. Um, from our team, um, we can supply to you, if necessary, a laser cut base plate as well as the power board. Um, now, if your team has laser cutting facilities available, uh, please consider um, using the CAD files that we gave you and the instructions to cut it yourself, uh, especially uh, if you're uh, in Asia or Europe. These things can take a while to ship, and it's, it's quite expensive. Um, so if you have the capability, please do build it yourself, but we're, we're happy to um, provide support even as far as cutting the chassis or building the power board for you. Um, so that's the hardware. With respect to the software, um, the big story here is that there isn't much of a story. Um, so all the message topics, the types of sensors we're using, uh, it hasn't changed, and, and this is why you know, teams choose to use ROS in the first place. Um, essentially, you can use the same software uh, setup that you had before. There are one or two gotchas. So uh, previous iterations used the TK1, and that had a version of Ubuntu 14.04 on it and uh, ROS Indigo. Um, these are uh, slightly outdated, but still sort of the de facto standard for robotics. Um, the new TX1 and TX2 support ROS Kinetic and Ubuntu 1604. Um, so there's some legacy OpenCV elements and uh, laser scanner, like the Hue node elements, which don't port directly uh, to Kinetic. Uh, however, there are more or less one to one replacements. Uh, so in Kinetic, you'll use the ERG node instead of the Hue node. And uh, so I'll try and update. Um, the build page with, with these uh, specific replacements for those modules that I know that uh, most teams will use. Um, in general, though, um, it's actually quite a bit simpler to get uh, Ubuntu uh, onto the Jetson device and, and ROS onto the Jetson uh, with the TX1 and TX2. I think it's a, a much easier process, more reliable. Um, another reason to use V2 uh, is that we have some upcoming features uh, which we'll be supporting on our website and detailing. Um, so we've had a, a lab at UPenn which uh, senior design projects created some open source wheel encoders for the vehicle, could provide better odometry, and uh, we're working to integrate uh, the VESC, it's an electronic speed controller. Uh, it's actually a device that most people are using in, in motorized skateboards, but uh, it turns out to be quite effective at uh, modulating the velocity of the vehicle and also uh, reading the pulse count on the motor. So another potential source of odometry. Um, and these will be upcoming features. I don't know if they'll be available by the competition, but uh, for the next iteration, certainly they will be. So the sooner that you get to V2, uh, the more prepared you'll be for the next iteration of the competition. Okay, so here's some videos. I don't know if it's too loud, so. Uh, so I'll show you the, the previous one. Um,
Okay, um, so both those videos are, are, are UPenn Group trying to shake down uh, the new version of the car. Um, and what I want to highlight is that, that these vehicles are very quick, they're very powerful. Um, and so that, that was going uh, almost 12 miles per hour in, in a five meter wide space, uh, basically five by 10 meters, it's quite small. Um, and what I want to highlight is that uh, we, were, we were using Bicon there, so we had 50 hertz odometry available, very accurate local, localization. Um, and in the last iteration of the competition, we didn't see a lot of teams, if any, localized. So um, sort of a, a teaser for if you could localize well, um, you have a lot more interesting control and planning methods available to you. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we we're excited about breaking out uh, you know, a mapping version of the competition as separate. We want new, uh, robust solutions in that area that don't rely on external service like a bike on system. Okay, so end of advertisement. Um, so this is the, the new power board that we've designed, and, and this is what's enabling um, the more compact uh, or center of gravity chassis. Um, so on board, we have LiPo protection for the new battery. Uh, which is very important. Uh, please uh, read and understand uh, the requirements of charging your, your LiPo battery and uh, keeping it in safe operating conditions. Um, if it's swelling or if you've, you've taken it down to a voltage that's unsafe, uh, it is a fire hazard, so be careful. Um, on board, we have a, a connector. Uh, so this is where the LiPo power comes in. And then power switches, which turn on the various components of the protection circuit, the DC to DC converter, and the outputs for the sensors and the TNC. Um, so previously, you had to create a separate assembly uh, to house the TNC and uh, the headers for uh, controlling the ESC on the vehicle. Uh, now all of this is uh, in one place on one board. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, power rails and connectors for uh, powering a uh, variety of your sensors and also the, the TX1 or TX2 compute module. Um, additionally, we have onboard uh, support for the, the wheel encoders that we're designing. So this is a uh, feature for the future which will be useful. Um, and here, um, you can see in this top right corner, we have two switches. Um, these allow you to switch your vehicle from autonomous to uh, manual mode. Uh, and you can you can do this independently. So you can have autonomous mode on the steering, but not the velocity or vice versa. It's quite useful for debugging. Um, so I'll pause here for a moment if there's any questions and then we'll get into the, the details of the build. I'll continue. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned, um, if you're interested in using V2 uh, and you need some help, um, you can contact us and we can supply a, a kit to some uh, you know, number of teams. Um, note that if, if you are quite far from, from Pennsylvania, then this could take a while, so please do try and um, use the, the open source resources that we've given. Um, so in this build, um, I'm going to highlight some of the differences. The, the first thing that you have to do is prepare uh, some of your components. So as I mentioned before, the Jetson TX1 and TX2, they come on a rather large dev board, uh, so large that it won't fit easily within the body of the, the chassis that we've designed. Uh, so the first thing to do is extract the, the TX1 or TX2 module, and, and note that they're both identical. Uh, it's about the size of a credit card. Uh, this has the GPU and, uh, and the ARM CPUs on it, as well as a heat sink and a fan, and uh, the connectors for the Wi-Fi antennas. So once you've done that, much as before, you're going to need to modify uh, the wiring harness on the ESC on board the vehicle. Uh, this is so that you can take uh, control of the steering and servo and the actual uh, DC motor, which drives the wheels. Um, so nothing's new there uh, compared to the last build, but I just want to note that this is part of the preparation. 
And at this point, you've already moved the body of the vehicle as well. Um, um, once you've done that, you need to prepare the base plate. And so uh, I, I want to point out that before, you know, there's upwards of 25 parts. Uh, this is the only part you need. It's one laser cut piece. And uh, you're going to install these hex standoffs on it. Uh, this is to raise it up uh, from the chassis so that there's uh, room for the battery and some airflow. So this is pretty simple. Uh, we think that the, the build time relative to before is maybe half an hour rather than three hours. So um, I think it should be a positive experience uh, for the team. Um, Next, once you've prepared this base plate, uh, you would install uh, your mounts for the camera and LiDAR. So there's two 3D printed pieces that fit on the front end of the chassis where you can uh, fit a depth camera. So this uh, fits quite nicely both the Asus Xteon uh, structured light cameras and the Z stereo camera. And directly above it, uh, there's a mounting plate for your LiDAR. Um, okay. So this, this is relatively simple. Um, again, uh, it's only three parts, so there's like, like four total parts uh, to support mounting of the hardware uh, on the chassis. And you can refer to the build video and documentation to see how to do this. Um, Next, uh, we're going to mount the chassis plate, and we're going to install uh, the Jetson uh, carrier board. So note that you've extracted the module from the dev kit, and uh, there's a socket that you can uh, push the pins of the Jetson into. Uh, and this carrier board, it, it has USB, Ethernet, HDMI uh, power, and uh, some screws. Um, which you can secure the Jetson uh, module to this board with. Uh, and I would recommend using standoffs um, between the Jetson module and the carrier board itself. And I think you'll, you'll see when you do the install, um, it's possible to over torque these screws and, and get some bending of the carrier board, which is undesirable. Okay. So, once you've done that and uh, you've mounted the power board much the same way that you mount the Jetson board, um, you can use the existing bracket that comes with the dev board from the Jetson TX1. And we actually have a place to mount that on the power board. Uh, this is where the antennas for the Jetson's onboard Wi-Fi will sit. It's pretty simple, it's just some nuts. I'll fast forward here. Two antennas. These also come with the with the TX1 and TX2 kits, so you don't need to search for these. And you're done. Once you've done all this, uh, really what remains uh, is to continue making the, the remainder of the connections. Uh, so you, you need to connect uh, the ESC and the steering servo uh, to the TNC microcontroller. So there's header pins here for that. And you'll need to connect power to the LiDAR and power to the Jetson board itself. Um, servo, let us start with CH2. That will go to CON1 on the power board. So the pin closest to the team Z is ground on the power board. So make sure the wire which is connected to ground inside the car on the ESC and the ground on the power board match. So CH2 goes to CON1. CH1 goes to CON2. ESC 
ESC goes to CON3. And finally, servo goes to CON4. Now mount the flashed TNZ onto the power board. So please refer to the silk screen footprint of the TNZ and make sure the USB is facing outside, is facing the LiDAR. Okay, so um, again, I'd like to reiterate that these build videos are now available on the website um, and the bill of materials is also available on the website. And uh, I'll make it more clear uh, where the link to the open source uh, docs describing the design of the power board uh, and the laser cut chassis as well as the associated CAD is. Uh, that'll be an update to the website shortly, but I believe Madura has answered the question before. Uh, within 30 minutes of this call, you can expect that to be updated. Um, yeah. Um, so, here's some questions that I'm anticipating. Um, V1 versus V2. You can use either for the competition. Uh, the major difference between V1 and V2 is the ease of building the vehicle. Uh, and in V2, we're more actively trying to identify and get rid of end-of-life parts. Um, I would not say that uh, in race, racing, you gain a significant advantage by using V2, uh, but there may be some margin there. Um, they bo they're both approximately the same weight, the motors haven't changed, um, and uh, you know, your software stack is your software stack. That's the real difference maker. Um, if you've already built V1 or developed software for V1, uh, nothing significant changes in your software to move to V2. Uh, just be aware of the differences between uh, ROS, Indigo, and Kinetic. You may have to uh, download a slightly different or updated uh, ROS package. Um, we understand that the timeline is uh, quite tight between now and the actual competition, and, and we ourselves have been uh, sort of working around the clock to shake down V2. Um, for the next iteration of the competition, uh, we're hoping that everybody will use the V2 solution, but we understand right now if the, the time is pretty tight. Um, and I'd like to highlight that, and unlike the last iteration of the competition, we intend to be more flexible with custom or variants from teams. So if you have a proposed variants um, that you'd like to ask about right now, um, please do so. Uh, this is a great time to ask questions uh, and a good way that other teams can um, sort of hear the organizer's answers as well, um, and hopefully head off any confusion. So I'll, I'll pause for a moment. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on. Uh, you, forum's always available uh, for questions. Um, Again, um, you can pick T TK1, TX1, TX2, it's your call. Uh, you can use V1 or V2. Um, we've opened up uh, you know, the selection of IMUs to teams. We've recommended three, and they have three pretty different price points. Um, more expensive is not always better. Um, and regarding the, the LiDAR, you know, there's the Hakuyu models that we've been talking about. Uh, there's also new very low cost models from a company called Scans. They have a Scans sweep. Um, we've never tried it. If your team's interested in trying it, please go for it. Um, and yeah, there's a wide variety of monocular and depth cameras. Uh, again, we don't have very many restrictions on what you can use. Uh, we're interested to see uh, what teams will try. So. Uh, Moving on, uh, we've, we've covered uh, the new V2 platform. I've showed you some videos of us shaking it down and uh, told you that the website has been uh, updated to include new information about the V2 platform. And we went through the build uh, sort of step-by-step step in, in not great detail, but 
actually, more so than nothing. And so now I'm going to tell you about two new software and, and sort of uh, lab-like modules that we're going to be adding to the F110 website shortly. Um, so as you might know, uh, there's a sister competition slash class at MIT called Racecar, uh, which also uses the Traxxas F110 platform. And they've developed a simulator uh, for the platform in Gazebo. And uh, the new lab that we're hoping to provide you um, is an extension of the existing drive straight and, and wall following labs, um, except that it can be done virtually. So your team does not need to build a car in order to prototype their algorithms. Um, now, I wouldn't say that the simulation is blazing fast, um, but it is a way to try things out uh, virtually in software before you actually put your car on the ground. Um, we think it will be a, a useful tool in getting started for teams that might be waiting on parts or um, uh, finishing and completing a build. Um, so we've remapped uh, our topics, uh, topics that are, are referred to in the various uh, teaching modules in, in build and race um, into the simulator. So you'll, you'll be able to use uh, you know, existing code that conforms with the labs that we've uh, posted before. Um, the second point is that um, we are encouraging teams to attempt uh, to localize if they think it will be useful for them in competition. And one of the problems with this is that, that the quality of the localization is often quite dependent on a number of features in the environment. So for example, um, in a hallway like this, uh, with just the LIDAR, it can be very difficult because uh, there's, there's no interesting geometry uh, that you can see with the range of the sensor you have. Um, so we're proposing to add some April tags to the course. We're not going to tell you the position of the tags and global coordinates. And the position of the particular tag might even change between sessions. So uh, we're not hoping that you memorize the position of all the tags. Uh, in, in a very naive sense. However, your algorithm may accomplish that um, in a robust sense um, later. We're gonna try and make sure that some tags are visible um, from a variety of poses on the course, especially along the race line, but how you utilize the tags is up to your team. And so these slides will be shared later, but there's a link uh, to some resources on April tags. And, and I'd like to just say that it's a very, uh, robust uh, framework for sort of uh, fiducials using a, a vision system. Uh, it's very easy to use. Um, so what is an April tag? It's sort of like a uh, QR code. Um, it's a fiducial. It has a known size and a unique pattern. So uh, using the April tag uh, resources, drivers that are available in ROS, uh, you'll be able to connect a camera uh, to your system and process it through the April tag node and detect the, a the presence of the fiducial, uh, your pose relative to it, and the unique pattern that identifies it. So given this sort of basis, uh, what becomes easy is computing your pose and uh, if you have consecutive measurements of the same tag, your odometry relative to a particular point in space. However, you do not know where that point is within the map. So the challenge for your team would be to be able to understand, for example, using SLAM, um, where that tag exists in the world based on other features. Um, or you can simply just fuse the result as, as reliable odometry or your new idea. Um, so I think that is somewhat a research topic, but um, it should alleviate some of the uncertainty about will my car perform well on this course. Um, and uh, we'll provide more details about the density and, and locations of proposed locations of the April tags, uh, most likely at the next webinar. But um, if, if your team is concerned about local, localizing or odometry, so if, if you've gotten to that point, 
uh, you may understand that, that this could be a problem for you. And uh, this is uh, something we're providing to try and make it easier um, and encourage interesting solutions. So um, that's, that's what I've got for today. And uh, we're happy to answer questions now, both Madura and myself. Um, and uh, I'd like to hear from you um, in terms of feedback on the call. Um, if there's things that you'd like us to cover in the future or that you're uncertain about, please let us know. Thanks. All right, thank you, Matt. Yeah, let's open the floor for any questions that you may have, both regarding the build or the logistics and the schedule of the competition. I'll ask a question on behalf of the teams for you, Matt. Uh, okay. The for the April tags localization stuff, are you planning to put resources on the website to point people in the right direction? Yeah, so uh, that's why I, I I should have explained this better. Um, we're considering both the uh, simulation portion and the April tags uh, portion uh, to be two new labs. Um, we're not going to provide code that does slam for you, but we will provide sort of a skeleton that says this is how you would set up your vehicle to read, uh, you know, subscribe to a camera and uh, read the April tab tags topic. Um, Perfect. Good. So just the basics, not, not a solution, but you should be able to start relatively easily. Any other questions? So once again, if <clears throat> if you don't have a question right now, a great place to post a question uh, is the forum on the f110.org uh, website. We usually respond very fast, especially these days leading up to the competition. Uh, if you or your team uh, are considering updating your existing build to the version two, or you want to build a version two from scratch again, uh, we can send you a pre-built power board uh, as long as you, you know have the correct Jetson TX1 or TX2 platform. Uh, and also, if you are registered for the competition, that's another way for us to uh, ensure that uh, our power board will be utilized for the race itself. So you should send us your shipping address, and we'd be happy to uh, send you a power board. Um, it, may, it may arrive in time for this first uh, this competition this year, or you can certainly use it down the line. Uh, for subsequent competitions, and we have plenty of those uh, lined up for you as well. Uh, so I would like to thank everyone for dialing in at, uh, to this webinar, um, and I look forward to meeting all the teams and having an exciting and historical event uh, in Porto later this year. So we will be in touch with all the teams uh, and their point of contacts over email regarding uh, exact specifications of the qualification video, any subsequent webinars, uh, and once again, you know, as the logistics and the detail agenda become available, the details of the track become available, we will share all of those with all the teams as well. So with this, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I would like to thank you again for your time, and uh, we can close this webinar right now. Hey, Madhur. Uh... I have a question. I'm Vivek uh, from KTH Stockholm. Mm -hmm. uh, we were thinking, is it possible to change the tires for our car? It, it, it is allowed, yeah. I would say that's not a big deal for us. So if you find that you can get better traction tires. Um, so the only thing you have to be careful of is that the tires shouldn't be such that they damage the floor of the arena. Um, okay, okay, yeah. But I can understand and it. The default stock tires are slipping at higher speeds, and you can fix them. Uh, you can change mm -hmm. that, but if the organizers feel that it's causing damage to our track, we may ask you to revert to your old tires. So carry that set with you, the default. Okay, speed. so is it also possible to use different tires during the competition if we have like three sets of tires? Why not? Yeah, you can have your own pit stop. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. Sure. So that, that's a good question, yeah. So um, any other questions? Okay, I have a question. I'm Binsu from KAIST. 
yeah, uh, you know, the four person one, uh, the LIDAR is located at higher than the bottom to the right. The LiDAR is, even when it's located higher on, on the version one build, it is still able to uh, reliably detect eight in, eight to 12 inches of, uh, of the balls or the side of the tracks. Oh, okay. But if you want it to be more reliable, uh, it was just a suggestion. It's not a requirement for the competition. Uh, since the LiDAR is a very key piece of sensor and it's also a very fast sensor to give you a sense of um, where you are with respect to the left and right side walls of the track. Um, it's just helpful if the rider is mounted a little bit lower to the ground to give it the best possible chance uh, to detect because the it, it turns out that at high speeds, the suspension of the car uh, will actually tilt the car left and right. And if the LiDAR is mounted up high, uh, it can sometimes even see over the wall or over the, over the track and that can confuse your algorithms. Um, but we will promise a track of at least 8 to 12 inches high. Okay. Any other questions? We still have a few minutes left on this call. Okay, one one very short question. Do you sure. hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. This is this is Kiru from KAIS. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, as I understood in the time trial race, uh, in the time trial race, we don't have any uh, uh, mapping data. For example, in hectare mapping data, in that trial, uh, any mapping data is not provided before the race. Is that right? Yes, we will not share any kind of a LiDAR map or uh, any map. Uh, I don't know if you meant just the layout of the track, if that's what you meant as a map. Uh, that will be shared with you once we finalize what the track can look like. Um, but you will get a chance to run your own mapping during the practice session. Uh, and this is actually a good point to uh, even illustrate uh, another thing, which is um, we actually want like good algorithmic solutions, right? So uh, in the previous... Just to give you an example, in the previous competition when we were racing in corridors, um, mm. there were some teams which were not mapping or doing anything smart, but with, they just tuned their car to run for a certain amount of time and then slow down and make a turn and then run fast for a certain amount of time based on the shape of the track because it was just a rectangle and 90 degree turns. So that's not a very smart or autonomous solution, although it may get, get you a fast lap time. So just to avoid this kind of uh, hard, uh, you know, hard, like hard-coded hacking of the okay. track, we, want, we, will, we will set up the practice track and you can map and try out your algorithms there. But the, during the race itself, the, the practice track and the race track may not be exactly the same. And part of the reason is that uh, this there's going to be other events which are going on in this arena and so we have to dismantle the track and set it up again uh, between the practice sessions and for the race itself so we cannot guarantee that the track will look exactly the same every time therefore it's up to your solution and your mapping algorithms to do a good job of building the map and then racing your car in that mapping environment the other comment yeah, think... on your question is uh, it doesn't matter if you use maps or don't use maps for the time trial. The goal of the time trial is to set the fastest time and whatever method you use, you can use that. The mapping um, racing is a special uh, category of race itself where only teams which are mapping will be allowed to race or at least showcase their ability to map. So that's a separate racing category for time trials. Whether you build a map or whether you are just doing smart localization or doing this odometry based racing, that is fine. Uh, you don't necessarily have to build a map for time trials. Okay, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, any other last pressing questions before we end the webinar? Perfect. Okay. Uh, I, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. Actually, uh, could you please? I'm. I noticed that you are recording the session. Uh. And if you can send us uh the 
the recorded session that we can review one more time the webinar if it's possible absolutely yeah so that's the reason why i was recording the session itself oh, yeah. and yeah, i thought so <laughs> we will share the slides as well so every team by the way who is uh, on the call they should have their own point of contact which was listed in the form uh, and we usually yeah. Just email one person, which is the point of contact for the team. Uh, we'll send him the slides and the link to the recording of this webinar as well. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay, with that, I'd like to close this webinar. And like I said before, I look forward to a very eventful and exciting race uh, in Portugal. And so see you in about a month's time. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you.